my pleasure to introduce to you tonight our speaker, Daniel M. Kimmel. My name is Michelle Reed. I'm a sophomore here at Hillsdale College studying philosophy and religion. I'm from Walker, Michigan. Daniel M. Kimmel is the past president of the Boston Society of Film Critics and founding co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. Mr. Kimmel has taught film and media courses at Suffolk University and Emerson College. His reviews appeared in the Worcester, Telegram, and Gazette for many years and can now be found at NorthShoreMovies.net. Mr. Kimmel has written on the histories of Fox TV and DreamWorks, a recipient of the Skylark Award for the New England Science Fiction Association. He was also nominated for the Hugo Award for the book Jar Jar Binks Must Die and Other Observations about science fiction movies. He is also the author of Shh, It's a Secret, a novel about aliens, Hollywood, and the bartender's guide, Time on My Hands, My Misadventures in Time Travel, and I'll Have What She's Having, Behind the Scenes of the Great Romantic Comedies. Please join me in welcoming Daniel M. Kimmel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thanks. It's great to be back here. I was here four years ago, and I said I would love to come back and speak again, but don't ever invite me to speak on Oscar night. <laughs> that's, that's my Super Bowl, that's, you know, but, but not a problem this year. All right, so tonight my topic is the comedy of Billy Wilder. And uh, when the American Film Institute uh, put together a list of the funniest movies of all time in 2000, some Like It Hot came in as number one. Now that's a tall order, the funniest comedy ever made. When I was teaching film, which I did for about 25 years, I had the same problem with Citizen Kane, not as the funniest movie ever made, but how could any film live up to the reputation of the greatest movie ever made, especially if it was in black and white, and, I, and, the, and the, especially the, and the kids didn't know anybody who was in it. So let's begin by saying that such lists are interesting, especially for helping to recommend films that you might not have seen, but the ranking themselves are relatively unimportant. Now, I've taught Billy Wilder films, and in fact have used all of the films you're screening this week. They are certainly four of his best. And what's fascinating about Wilder to me is that he excelled at both comedy and drama. And one can find instances of his sardonic humor in all of his films. In spotlighting his comedy, my first inclination was to go through all of his movies and celebrate them all. Then I woke up and realized that for the students here, Some Like It Hot may be the first Billy Wilder comedy you've ever seen. My analyzing the seven-year itch or Irma La Douce might be brilliant and incisive, but it might as well be in Greek for people who've never seen them. And of course, the students here are studying Latin, so that wouldn't have helped. <laughs> so I'll be citing examples from his other movies, but I've decided to take a different approach. Using Some Like It Hot as our basis, I want to give you the tools so that you can go off on your own and watch his other movies with some degree of expertise. And you should. As I used to tell my students, you don't walk into a museum and say, just show me the new paintings, right? It's like, no, I don't need to see that Rembrandt and Picasso stuff. Just, what, what did you get last week? That we've got, with Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and Turner Classic Movies, not to mention our libraries, you have access to more than a century of cinema. When I was a college student, I would be scanning, the, the, they don't even exist anymore, the revival houses, the theaters showing classic movies. Is there a chance some movie I've always wanted to see could be showing up or on the late, late show at two in the morning? Uh, now, no matter um, you know, what your age, and I know it's not just students here tonight, um, you have the unprecedented ability to explore the movies as never before in history. You can look at films in a variety of ways. When they were made, what genre they are, what country they came from, or following the career of a particular star. But when you have a director with a strong point of view, what the French critics refer to as an auteur, it's a fancy word for author, going through the films of the director's career can be illuminating. 
Think of Alfred Hitchcock or Martin Scorsese or Woody Allen. Uh, when you look at their body of work, you discover the imprint that makes their films easily distinguishable from the works of others. Now, the summer after I graduated from the University of Rochester in upstate New York, I had one of the most unusual jobs I've ever had. I was working as a security guard at ABC. And I'm not, I have a great story about that, which I'm not going to tell you now, but ask me at the reception later. Uh, I had Tuesdays and Wednesdays off, and by chance, a, a place, I don't even know if it exists anymore, the Carnegie Hall Cinema uh, in New York City was doing a series that summer of the films of Billy Wilder. And so every week I got to attend a Billy Wilder double feature, and I began to notice things that I might not have picked up on if I had been seeing the films separately or spread out over time. I've since read a great deal about Wilder's films, including the wonderful book Conversations with Wilder, which was done by the filmmaker Cameron Crowe, uh, himself a great fan of Wilder. Indeed, Crowe had hoped to cast Wilder as the agent who appears in a flashback as the mentor to Jerry Maguire, but Wilder didn't want to appear in front of the camera. And that might be a good place for us to start. Wilder, as you no doubt have learned by now, was Austrian by birth and did his first work in the movies in Germany and France. He came to the United States through a complicated process that had him leave the United States and live for a, a short while in Mexico and then re-enter the United States. Um, and, and a famous anecdote, he told the immigration official that he wanted to go to Hollywood and make movies. And the official, approving his application, told him, make good ones. <laughs> I, I think he lived up to that. So like other immigrants, Wilder, his first job was to acquire a, a, a fluency in American English. And for those of us born here, this seems second nature. But English is a peculiar language and not always easy to master. Though Wilder did, it seems he was always self-conscious about it. He, his English was a very colloquial English. He, he picked it up from listening to the radio, reading comic strips. Um, and yet throughout his career, when it came time to write a script, he always preferred to work with one or more writers. You don't see any scripts that are just by Billy Wilder. It's always, uh, for example, one of his two most famous partners, one of them was Charles Brackett, who you've heard about, um, with whom he did Sunset Boulevard, among many other films. And the other uh, famous partner that he had a long uh, partnership with was I.A.L. Diamond, with whom he did Some Like It Hot, and The Apartment, among many other films. Now, both Brackett and Diamond did do some work on their own. Uh, Brackett, as you heard the other night, was so appalled by the storyline of double indemnity that Wilder ended up uh, doing most of the work with Raymond Chandler because uh, Brackett really didn't want to participate in it. Wilder was not an easy person to work with as a writer, especially if you had a thin skin. Uh, when George Axelrod uh, co collaborated with him on The Seven Year Itch, Axelrod brought a manuscript with him, which was a copy of his own hit Broadway play. And uh, he figured they would be using that to adapt into the, the movie version. And he told Wilder, here's a copy of my play. And, and Wilder replied, good, we can use it as a doorstop. <laughs> Ernest Lehman, was another collaborator of, of Wilder. They did, they did the script for Sabrina. Now, Lehman would ha also have a long and distinguished career, but this was fairly early on. And working with Wilder on Sabrina was meant working on a set where there was a lot of tension. Humphrey Bogart was a Warner Brothers star working at Paramount for the first time, and he was very uncomfortable because Wilder and his co-stars, Audrey Hepburn and William Holden, uh, were, were Paramount stars. And so Bogart felt like the odd man out. To make it a little more complicated, the story involved uh, Hepburn as the chauffeur's daughter uh, having a crush on the dashing son of uh, her father's boss, played by William Holden, and yet having to end up with the older brother played by Humphrey Bogart. Uh, that was the plot, 
behind the camera, she was having an affair with William Holden. So it, it was a very tense set. And at one point, Lehman ended up having a nervous collapse. And, and the doctor ordered him to stay away from the set and go home and several days bed rest and just not work on the movie. On the doctor's last visit, where he pronounced Lehman cured and ready to go back to work, as he left, he said, oh, and you can tell Mr. Wilder he can come out of the closet now. Wilder had been hiding in the closet so the doctor wouldn't see him because he couldn't imagine making any changes on the script without working with his collaborator. With Diamond, Diamond's real, real name was Isidore. He was known as Izzy Diamond. The AL was an affectation. He thought it made him look fancier. True. Uh, and Diamond, he gave uh, an additional credit, not simply co-writer. He was also an associate producer. And uh, he, Wilder said, Diamond got this credit because he was the only one willing to associate with the producer, who was Wilder. Uh, in fact, what it meant was that Diamond had the right to be on the set, which was highly unusual for writers of that era. Uh, usually they turned in the script and that was the last they had to do with it or that, you know, they might be asked for rewrites. But actually being on the set, seeing the shooting, interacting with the actors, this was not done. And Wilder wanted his collaborator there. Uh, for Wilder, the script always came first. And it was not simply because they couldn't shoot blank pages, uh, because he had started out as a screenwriter. This is where he created his movies. Among his early credits before he became a director were such movies as Ninochka and Ball of Fire. However, while he revered Ernst Lubitsch, the director of Ninochka, he was less enthusiastic about at least some of the other directors who filmed his scripts. And so he decided he needed to direct himself because uh, these other directors, they would let the actors ad lib or they would make changes on the set. And Wilder felt, no, I'm handing you the script. This is the film you need to make. So he began in 1942 directing with a movie called The Major and the Minor. He was lucky, and this is, you want, you want a, 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 a series you could do in the future, uh, Preston Sturgis was another top comedy writer who in 1940 became a director. And uh, as a result of his success, and he was one of the top comedy directors in the 1940s, other writers started saying, you know, we would like to direct too. John Huston was another one, Joseph Mankiewicz, and Billy Wilder. So uh, for Wilder, it he felt directing was the way to protect the words on the page. When you watch a Wilder movie, you have to listen. Every word has been chosen with care. And if the actor decided to improvise or change the dialogue, and some did, Wilder would make them do it again. Like, you know, this afternoon, those of you who watch Some Like It Hot, there's a whole little running joke about typo blood. It's, a, it's just a little minor thing, but you better say typo or the joke doesn't work. And so there were all, all, all sorts of little things like that that he would plant in the script that it had to be done just right. So let's take a, a deeper look at Some Like It Hot. Wilder and Diamond uh, took the plot from a story that had already been made into films in France and Germany under the title Fanfares of Love. In those films, two musicians disguise themselves to perform in various bands. They're basically down in their luck musicians who they get dressed up as gypsies, or uh, as women, or you know, different, just different things to get into a band to get a job. Wilder and Diamond threw that out. What they liked was the idea of two men who for some reason have to dress up as women and perform in an all-girls all band. And they said, all right, now we have a concept. What are we going to do with it? And Diamond came, pointed out that when the classic American cross-dressing play, uh, the, the, the classic comedy of the American stage, Charlie's Aunt, was ever performed. It was almost always performed in period. And Diamond said the reason for that is that if everybody in the play is in period costume, then the two guys dressed as women are just two more characters in funny costumes. And so they decided we need to do this in period. 
So then they had to decide what time period to set the story in. And they decided on Prohibition, which provided them with the plot of why these characters had to dress up as women. They had witnessed the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and they were on the run from the mob. Now, if you're familiar with Wilder's other movies, you see that this notion of disguise or changing or hiding identities is something that occurs again and again. In the major and the minor, Ginger Rogers, an adult woman, has to pretend she's a young girl and hide out at a girl's school. In Double Indemnity, both the perpetrators of the murder have hidden agendas, even from each other. In Stalag 17, set in a German prisoner of war camp, one of the captives is actually a German spy. In Irma Le Deuce, Jack Lemmon pretends to be a British gentleman so he can prevent Irma, played by Shirley MacLaine, from prostituting herself. In The Fortune Cookie, Walter Matthau's lawyer gets his brother-in-law, Jack Lemon, to pretend that his injuries are much more serious so that they can scam the insurance company. You see the pattern here. In Some Like It Hot, there are multiple layers of disguise. Tony Curtis plays three characters. As Joe, he's the alpha male. Uh, he, the brash guy who pushes his friend Jerry around, gets them to hock their coats in the middle of a Chicago winter, and is clearly the sort of lowlife who has been Sugar's typical boyfriend. But notice that when he becomes Josephine, he becomes the opposite. Josephine is refined and demure, a proper young lady, or at least one who would travel with an all-girls band. As part of her made-up biography, she even claims to have studied in a conservatory, and as we later find out, without really understanding what that means. Now, now compare that with Jerry. As Jerry, he's a patsy. Yet when he gets into drag, something happens. First of all, notice he's not Geraldine. He rejects that. He becomes Daphne. And Daphne is a hot ticket. She slaps her base. She has, she's brash the way he never was as Jerry. His big scene with sugar in the upper berth of the train shows a confidence in the surprises that he imagines that will soon be uncovered. And he reverts to Jerry only when the arrival of the other women in the band make it likely that his secret's going to be revealed. Now, Joe has a third identity as Shell Oil Jr. Wilder asked Curtis if he could affect the Boston accent, because he said Shell Jr. has to sound different from, from Joe and from Josephine. Curtis on his own, with Wilder's permission, decided he was going to go with a Cary Grant voice. And this has layers of meaning for, for in a Wilder film. Wilder had always wanted to work with Cary Grant. And Cary Grant was you know, experienced at comedy and farce. And for some reason, he liked Wilder. They were, they were friendly. He backed out of two Wilder films he was supposed to be in. He was supposed to have the Humphrey Bogart role in Sabrina, and he was supposed to have the Gary Cooper part in Love in the Afternoon, and in both cases he decided he didn't want to do it. Uh, so it also leads to the wonderful moment where Jerry mocks him by imitating him, imitating the Cary Grant voice and going, nobody talks like that. <laughs> and Shell Oil Jr. is Curtis's most interesting incarnation in the film. He's hot for sugar, we know that, but having learned how she's been hurt by people just like him while he was Josephine, he's now taking a different tack, pretending to be impotent or at the very least asexual so that sugar is put in the position of having to seduce him. And thus sugar too has to take on another identity. Instead of the hapless victim, that we've come to know so far, she becomes the aggressor, going after Shell Oil with a confidence we haven't seen in her earlier. Now, we can go on and on and find other examples of people assuming alternate identities, from the brassy band leader who presents herself as Sweet Sue, uh, and the rowdy musicians who are the society syncopators, uh, to Spatz Colombo, who shows up for a mob meet that's being presented as the Friends of the Italian Opera. Since this is a theme that recurs in so many Wilder films, it's natural to ask why. 
Now, I don't want to spoil the joke by getting too serious and explaining it. However, it's part of the reason the film resonates, and I was very pleased that apparently still resonates today. Both Jerry and Joe get to explore other aspects of their personalities, indeed the opposite of who they ordinarily are, by donning drag. When they finally revert to their male identities at the end of the film, they are different people as a result. Joe confesses to Sugar who he really is and will presumably treat her differently now that he's come to see how his past romantic flings uh, you know, have been experienced from the female side. As for Jerry, who sets up Osgood with, uh, with the film's immortal closing line, which, which I'll get back to, uh, think about how he starts that, that, that last scene by reverting to his passive personality and explaining why they can't get married. You know, I smoke. I can never have children. And by the end, he's boldly asserting himself as Jerry taking off his wig and going, I'm a man. You know, that's, that's a big change for this character. Now, let's, uh, don't stick together. There we go. Now, I've mentioned how Wilder learned English from very colloquial sources like uh, comic strips and radio programs. Wilder was also a very cultured person who put, put together a famously impressive uh, personal collection of art. He was a serious art collector. Uh, but in his films, he was making pop culture references long before that became a Hollywood cliche. When Ginger Rogers arrives at the girls' academy in the major and the minor, a row of teen girls turn to her, all sporting the peekaboo hairstyle that was made famous by 1940s actress Veronica Lake. Sunset Boulevard, of course, is filled with movie references, some that were clearly in jokes, one that I'll point out that may have eluded you, uh, like having Jay Livingston and Ray Evans at the piano of a New Year's party, leading a group singing the hit song, Buttons and Bows. The reason that's an in-joke is that Livingston and Evan were the ones who wrote that song. They were playing themselves. In the apartment, Baxter, you'll see this tomorrow, uh, invites Fran to the then hit Broadway show, The Music Man. In the original script, this was going to be the sound of music. But then Wilder, an Austrian Jew who had lost family in the Holocaust, was in New York for the location shooting and got tickets for the sound of music. And was appalled when he saw singing and, da singing and dancing Nazi, this is years before the producers, and he changed the script so they went to the music man instead. Some Like It Hot is also filled with several references to the classic gangster films of the 1930s. But if you don't know the films, you might not get the jokes. So I'm going to now point them out to you for those of you who don't know the classic gangster films. The casting of George Raft and Pat O'Brien as Spats and the, uh, the police detective uh, is part of it. Raft had played several gangster roles in the 30s and 40s, and Pat O'Brien had played opposite James Cagney in one of the great gangster films, Angels with Dirty Faces. Then there's the moment when Raft arrives at the hotel and has to check his guns. And there's a guy standing in there flipping a coin in the air, and Raft is annoyed, and he grabs the coin. He said, where'd you pick up that cheap trick? Well, he learned it from George Raft of the 1932 movie Scarface, where that was Raft's signature gesture in Scarface. Uh, and even better, who is the guy flipping the coin? It's Edward G. Robinson, Jr. Edward G. Robinson, I mean, we saw him in Double Indemnity, but his first great role was his Little Caesar. Uh, and then there's the, to top it off, there's the moment at the banquet where one of Spat's uh, henchmen says something stupid, you know, like, oh, we was in Rigoletto with you, boss. And, and what does Spats do? He picks up half a grapefruit because he's going to hit him in the face with it. And if you know the James Cagney movie, Public Enemy, which is the movie that made Cagney a star, one of the most notorious and, and, and uh, shocking scenes to 1932 audiences was when Cagney picks up a half a grapefruit and actually slaps Mae Marsh in the face with it. 
audiences in 1959 would have been much more likely to recognize these references. And it demonstrated to them that Wilder lived in the same world we did, sharing the same movies and other bits of pop culture as the rest of us. Now, another element of, of Wilder's comedies and dramas at their best is that he was always pushing the envelope. Sometimes he would be accused of bad taste, which I think is unfair, uh, but he would take on subjects and themes that other filmmakers felt couldn't be done. Double indemnity when the novel came out was sent to the production code office and, they, and the answer came back, no way, no how, this cannot be filmed. Wilder figured out a way to tell this story of adultery and murder within the confines of the production code. Uh, then he, when he did The Lost Weekend, you look at how movie drunks were portrayed prior to The Lost Weekend, they were comic figures, like the guy in Some Like It Hot Who Wants Another Cup of Coffee. That was the typical movie drunk. He does a serious movie about alcoholism that even has a scene with Ray Milan combating the delirium tremens, and the film was a hit and Milan won an Oscar. The frothy romantic comedy Sabrina has a scene where the ingenue played by Audrey Hepburn attempts to commit suicide. Sunset Boulevard, which also has a, a, an attempted suicide, was a movie narrated by a corpse telling how he became a kept man to a much older woman. The Seven Year Itch required a number of changes from the stage play, but was still about a married man tempted to have a fling, while The Apartment, which you'll see tomorrow, which won uh, Wilder three Oscars for Best Picture, Best Director, and sharing with Izzy Diamond for Best Screenplay, was about a man advancing his career by loaning his bed to his unscrupulous superiors. This was all pretty tough stuff, and Wilder did it, and he did it in ways that audiences could accept. W Wilder had a great run, and I'm partial to some of his later films.